good afternoon. Oh boy, I'm getting some feedback. Sorry, maybe I should have been more emphatic with my one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. Sound better? How does that sound? Okay, so three, four thumbs up. I'll take that as a go. Okay, sorry for the late start. We're, I don't know if this, this talk started at 2.30 or 2.40. When was it? Was it 40? Oh, so I'm not late. 2.30? 2.30, I am late. Okay, so <laughs> great. So we're off to a good start. So this is uh, Grails and the wonderful world of JavaScript frameworks. Um, I'm not going to bother telling you what the talk is about. I'll do that in the talk. So um, my name is Zachary Klein. That's a, my latest family picture. I've got three kids and a wife. Uh, we live in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I've been a Grails developer since 2010 and getting into front end in the last, past few years. Are we still a bit hot? Okay, I'll let you uh, tweak with that. And I uh, joined OCI in uh, 2015, um, mostly working on Grails and that lately uh, Micronaut. Uh, in fact, I've been doing a lot of uh, Micronaut stuff lately, so it's kind of nice to get back into the Grails world, which is really what I mostly do um, historically, and I, I really do enjoy Grails, and it's uh, my, framework, my framework of choice right now. Um, so, yeah, we're OCI, and uh, it, I'm having to add and Micronaut to everything now because that's the latest uh, cool new thing, but OCI is the primary sponsor of the Grails framework. Uh, most of the core Grails uh, contributors work on the team. Ooh, this is interesting. Um, no food, so please don't bring food in this session. Um, I'll carry on. Um, you've probably seen our table out in the front um, with the cool uh, remote control cars and all that kind of stuff going on, so please stop and say hi to us. Uh, there should be somebody around the table generally during the breaks. Um, are we back on? We're halfway there. Okay. A um, couple things we've actually put together a couple years ago now, um, so they're not so much new news, and hopefully you all know about them, but i just like to highlight them because I found out some folks haven't heard about these things. One is uh, start.grails.org, which is, um, if you've seen Spring Boot and their uh, Spring Initializer at startspring.io, this is essentially the same sort of a tool. You can use this to generate a Grails project, uh, pick your profile, pick your features, download it. You don't need to install Grails on your machine anymore because uh, the uh, wrapper script is included in the project. It will download the correct version for you every time. Uh, the other thing that we have going on is uh, the Grails Guides website. That's a bit of infrastructure we set up, uh, I believe, a couple years ago as well. And um, I've contributed a number of guides. Uh, a number of others on the team have. Um, and so there's a lot of helpful step-by-step -step tutorials, and including um, several that are um, related to what I'm talking about this afternoon. So um, please check that out. Slides are available at this bit.ly link. Um, I'll repeat the, that link towards the end. So, Grails. So one of the motivations of this talk is, um, and, and this really is focused on people who are using Grails and sort of the traditional MVC development flow. Um, you're not necessarily building microservices, or maybe you are for parts of your, of your system, but you still have um, you know, the dearly beloved monoliths that um, many of us, it's been our, our bread and butter for quite a while. And, um, but that's changing. And I'm really focused here on the, the web, web development. And when I say web, I kind of have a front end in mind, of, uh, a public facing, or not public, but user facing applications that, um, that use HTML, use CSS, use JavaScript, there's forms, there's tables, and users interact with them through browsers um, and perhaps through other clients as well. Um, and the scene of uh, web development is changing. So we've got a, a, lot of, a lot of new logos, a lot of uh, new players in, um, in fr uh, front-end web development. And again, when I say front-end, I don't just mean uh, JavaScript, even though that's kind of what this means. This I, I guess um, Keynote cha advances the slide when you shake the phone. Okay, um, I learned something new because I was not meaning to go through the slides that quickly. Um, so, let's take a little walk through history. So, uh, when JavaScript first started appearing on our web pages, our web applications, it was adding a little bit of 
of dynamic behavior to what was mostly a static medium um, in the browser. And so we had JavaScript, we could do cute animations and alerts and forms. Uh, and then we started to see libraries like Prototype and Scriptaculous, and both of these were included in Grails, actually, in earlier versions. Um, that started to add more sophisticated programming concepts to JavaScript, which, as we know, is um, not necessarily the most uh, sophisticated language. Um, and uh, this was a, a helpful little uh, primer on prototype of Scriptaculous that I remember reading back in the day. I always thought this quote here that I got highlighted was a little bit um, uh, ominous. Libraries make it much easier to create complex JavaScript. That was definitely the goal. More complex, more complexity, yes. Uh, then jQuery came along, and jQuery was, was the future, right? Um, for a lot of folks um, that I've worked with, jQuery is JavaScript. It's a, and uh, together with jQuery UI, it made it um, relatively easy to do the same sort of things that you could do with plain JavaScript, but you had a nicer API, you had a really cool selector and event system, and it was all cool. And J jQuery itself ended up being uh, included with Grails. And the thing about these JavaScript libraries is that for the most part, they fit very nicely into a traditional uh, Grails application model, right? MVC, right? Model, controller, view. And w regardless of whatever you decide to throw into the, the V there, you know, assuming if it's a Grails app, you're probably using uh, GSP pages. And you could have whatever JavaScript libraries that you want in there. You could use prototype, you could use jQuery, you could use lots of stuff. And then this happened. Um, <laughs> obviously, Angular is not, it wasn't the first JavaScript framework, and certainly not the only one, but it seemed to be a, a, uh, a major milestone. And uh, what we started to see um, in the, around uh, 2010 is when Angular came out, and a bunch of other frameworks started coming, coming out around uh, in the past, the, the ensuing couple years, is we started to see programming models such as MVC, and not all MVC, but sophisticated programming models being done in the browser, right? In front-end code, in code that up till now had mostly just been um, adding a little bit of spice to what was essentially a static view of data that was all processed and handled on the server. And so um, we started to see uh, these programming concepts and services and dependency injection, and, and, and of course this varies depending on the framework you're talking about. I'm, I'm speaking of Angular here. Um, and together with this, we started to see the rise of the JavaScript backend. And this is powered, of course, by Node.js. And so now you're starting to see full stack JavaScript from the front to the back, right? We have a, 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 a Node Express server that's kind of taking the spot where an application like Rails or a, a Spring Java application might have been. And the front end is, of course, its own JavaScript framework, something like Angular or, or, or what have you. So, um, Times are changing. And together with Node.js, we started to see things like NPM, so we can manage packages. And then we started seeing build tools like Grunt and Gulp. And then uh, some more, more dependency management with, from Bower. And then uh, some guy with mustache. And um, there's kept more things kept coming up that you have to learn bro broccoli. I guess it's useful for something healthy. Um, system J, or no, it's required J. I can't, I don't remember what these logos mean anymore. Yarn, that's a new one. Um, browser FI, definitely the future. System JS, unless you use System JS. Um, brunch, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, the, the, and I'm, you know, being a little bit tongue in cheek here, but there's a lot of tools out there. And I, for, I know for me, as a traditionally server side Grails developer who had to do some, you know, I did front end stuff. I knew CSS, I knew basic JavaScript. Um, th this gets a little bit intimidating and somewhat a little bit ridiculous. Um, there's just so many combinations of these things. And in all of it, it's kind of making Grails feel a little bit like we've gone the way of the dinosaur. And, uh, and that is definitely the perception that's out there. And, and it's unfortunate. Um, a lot of folks um, that I've talked to at conferences sincerely think that Grails is a CRUD page generator. Um, and that's, uh, couldn't be further from the truth. And in fact, I would argue that, um, to the contrary, Grails has a lot to offer um, if you are building uh, modern front-end, uh, even when you're building mo modern front-end uh, oriented applications. And I haven't mentioned the term yet, but 
I've kind of been getting, uh, talking around it, uh, the single page application, which has really become uh, one of the many buzzwords that, uh, that uh, developers are faced with these days. And, and single page applications have a lot of benefits. Uh, they can give a very nice user experience when done correctly, uh, emphasis on when done correctly. But even so, Grails has a lot to offer to single page application um, uh, developers. Um, Grails, from the beginning, has had very powerful REST capabilities, and most of these uh, single-page applications are primarily driven um, through a REST API. Um, we have advanced features like JSON and markup views to make it uh, very easy to customize uh, the output of your controllers and so forth. We have GORM, which is great for persistency, as many of us know. Um, and lately, we've added uh, support for GraphQL to GORM, which is extremely slick. And I wish we had a talk on it here. We don't. Um, you can literally create your whole GraphQL schema with one line of configuration in your domain class. You can have a lot more configuration than that if you want. But uh, writing a GraphQL server is not usually a trivial task. And uh, with GORM, it can be very trivial. And it's uh, quite, quite impressive. Um, convention over configuration. These are just general plugs for Grails that most of us already know. Um, we're compatible with Spring Boot and so forth. We, we have a lot of, a lot of very uh, developer-friendly, developer productivity-enhancing features that Grails provides that are still relevant, and that still can provide a very nice development experience. But if we're talking about building single-page applications, we're talking about um, dealing with front-end libraries and frameworks. We are going to have to go about that in some way? And that's, those are the questions that I'm hoping to kind of get at today. Uh, if it wasn't clear already, this is not going to be a talk with a lot of code in it. Uh, I have three ta or two talks, actually, in a, in a workshop at this conference. And they are progressively more and more heavy on code. Uh, so if this topic is interesting to you, um, tomorrow I'll be talking about Vue.js using many of the uh, not many, but using some of the stuff that we're going to talk about at a higher level today. And then on Friday, I'm doing a, uh, a short workshop on uh, using React with Grails. And both of those talks build logically upon this one. So if you're looking for more, or you want to see some of these ideas and approaches uh, in action, um, come check those out tomorrow and on Friday. So what tooling should we use? How should we organize our code and production? These are the kind of the, the larger questions that I'm hoping to look at. And because there's a lot of tools out there, and most of these tools uh, bring with them assumptions about how your, product, your, how your project is set up and how you go about your development work. And those conventions aren't necessarily the same as what we're used to when we're building a Grails application. Uh, one of my colleagues at OCI did a um, survey a few years back when he was working on some of the Angular support in Grails, and um, he was just trying to get people's feedback on what sort of build tools they wanted to see and where should, if you're going to be building a single-page application, uh, where, where does that code belong? It doesn't really fit into the traditional Grails project structure, and there's only putting it all into um, Grails app assets becomes a little unwieldy after a while. It's not really how it was designed to work. So the point of the pie charts here is just to illustrate there were a lot of, there's a lot of different opinion, opinions out there and, and um, not necessarily any established best practice. Um, so you want to build a Grails app with Angular or with React, um, or lately I've been talking more about Vue.js, uh, just exactly how do you go about doing that. And I've been doing this for a while now and I've done a number of production projects with different approaches and the, the, these are the three approaches that I've seen people use and that I've used when building a Grails application with a modern JavaScript front end. And those three approaches are with the asset pipeline, uh, something that I call the hybrid web app, which um, is basically a merger of what's above and below, and then finally the multi-project build which in many ways is the most straightforward, uh, but not necessarily the level of integration some people might want. So those are the three approaches we're going to be looking at today. We're going to start off with the uh, asset pipeline. The asset pipeline is a core Grails plugin. So if you've been using Grails for any length of time, you've probably already been using the asset pipeline. 
Um, but a lot of folks use the asset pipeline and don't actually know what it's doing for them. Um, it's a, a core, there's a core Grails plugin. I should mention here, I'm going to mention this again, the asset pipeline is not exclusive to Grails. It can be used um, in Rat Pack and Spring Boot. It can be used standalone in a static, a static uh, uh, basically a static website generator. Uh, so the asset pipeline itself is not a Grails plugin, but the, the Grails plugin that uh, provides that integration is core and is included by default. Uh, there's a lot of plugins available for the asset pipeline that extend it so it can handle other types of assets. It's a very high, highly performant uh, asset processor. And by assets, of course, I mean JavaScript, CSS, static uh, stuff that you want to serve uh, to, for your application. And of course, if we're talking about a single page application, those, quote, static assets might actually be code that itself is being processed in some way in order to, um, to, to run your application. It has support for CDNs. Um, and because it's a Grails plugin, you're still in the Grails view layer, right? So you still have access, you're still potentially using GSP pages. Uh, you're still potentially using the Grails internationalization uh, tag libraries. And, um, and it's been around for a while. And so if you're, if you're plugged into the Grails community, you are probably already aware of the asset pipeline. And there's a lot of, a lot of folks that are using it with uh, great success. And uh, I forgot to iterate through. Okay, uh, you can watch me click through my list. And, uh, whoops, let's say, it is actively developed. Uh, version 3.0 was just released today, um, which for the gentleman who released it, it was actually yesterday, but we're ahead of him. So. Um, it's a, a very active, um, actively developed plugin. There are a lot of plugins available for it. So most of the major JavaScript frameworks um, that we're going to talk about today, you can use them with the asset pipeline. The asset pipeline works pretty uh, straightforwardly. Um, hopefully you can read that diagram from there. I'm at an odd angle down here. Um, all the front end um, stuff for your that you're going to use to, to create your application is going to live in the Grails app assets directory. And that's just a, that's configurable, but that's the way it's set up in Grails. And then uh, the asset pipeline will process all those files through whatever plugins that you have included um, in your project. And so, for example, we could have the JSX plugin and we could have the SAS plugin um, for processing React, com React components and uh, SAS CSS files. Um, the asset pipeline works based on file extensions, so which is something to be aware of because that will that's something you have to do sometimes differently. Uh, for example, if you're writing a React app, um, typically these days um, you will use the .js extension for all your React components. They don't usually use a .jsx or anything like that. But to use the asset pipeline, it depends on that file extension, and so you will have to use .jsx in order to write React components that, are, that will work with the asset pipeline. So that's something else to be aware of. Um, once the asset pipeline has processed those and apply whatever other uh, optimization configuration you might have, um, then it delivers that to the browser. Or rather, it delivers that as an available a um, asset to be uh, loaded in, in the page in the browser. And like I said, it's already included in Grails. So if you're building a Grails application, um, it's newer than, I believe, 2.2, um, you already have the asset pipeline. Um, if you're creating a new application with a, a profile that does not include the asset pipeline by default, you can include it uh, with the asset pipeline feature. And you can always add the dependency yourself if for some reason you're working on a project that doesn't have it. And you'll notice that there's actually a couple plugins um, that are being used. There's the asset pipeline Gradle plugin. Um, which links the, the processing of assets into the, build, into the Gradle build process. Um, then there's the actual runtime dependency for the plugin itself, and then any number of dependencies for the, the different extension plugins that you might be using. So for example, this is the plugin you would use if you're building a React app with the asset pipeline. A lot of the asset pipeline uh, spe uh, framework-specific support that at least I'm aware of uh, is uh, surrounding Angular, and that's just because a lot of folks using uh, Grails and using the asset pipeline are also using Angular, and so there's a bunch of plugins that are available uh, for that. Uh, these are for older versions of Angular, um, uh, not so much for the Angular 2 on up, uh, which I'm not sure if there's maybe that they're not that necessarily needed. I'm not really familiar with uh, 
all that's changed in the most recent verses of Angular. Um, so there's a profile for Angular that does use the ASA pipeline. Um, that's the Angular JS profile. It's still available. It was renamed. This used to be called just the plain Angular profile, but that name has changed. And there's also a Angular scaffolding plugin. This is not really specific to the ASA pipeline, but if you use it together with it, it, it does it does um, does work. And so this lets you generate essentially the same sort of CRUD pages that you would get from running Grails generate all um, in a GSP. Uh, but now you can get that as Angular uh, components, which is kind of cool. And uh, so that's something that's, uh, that's been available for a while. Um, I'm not sure if too many folks are using it yet, but it, it's out there. Anyone here heard of Lazy Bones? Sort of a template generator? Couple, okay, yeah, a couple hands. Um, just something to be aware of. There is a, a template uh, in Lazy Bones for Angular and Grails, and it also is using the asset pipeline. So that's why I'm including this, these basically just case studies, if you will, um, of uh, plugins and, and templates that are already using the asset pipeline uh, for Angular applications. So a couple negatives about using the asset pipeline for a, a single page application um, with a JavaScript framework. Um, it's the support for the latest JavaScript tooling can, can um, be a bit laggy. Um, by that I mean there might be a new, uh, I mean, if you've been following front end development for any length of time, you know that we get a new framework every week and you know, the guys that work on the SF pipeline have real jobs and they can't be um, adding support for JavaScript frameworks every day. And so there can be a little bit of, of delay in getting support for, for those uh, tools. But it usually does come along if there's any interest anyways. Um, this is not necessarily a downside, but it's just a, a fact. If, you're, if you want to use the SF pipeline, you're going to have a harder time also using any of the JavaScript build tooling that's out there. And we're going to talk a little more about that uh, in just a little bit. So that might not be a negative if you don't want to be involved, if you don't want to have to deal with all that stuff, but it is something to be aware of. Um, hot reloading is a, something that's different about the, uh, the development workflow, like I talked about. Um, a lot of these front end frameworks and build tools support this concept of hot reloading where the changes you make in your IDE are reloaded instantly, or not instantly, but they're reloaded usually via some sort of a WebSocket connection in your browser without even refreshing the page. And it's a little bit, it's, it's neat, it's cool uh, to see it happen. Um, so as you're developing, you control S or command S to save your file and the app will reload. In some cases, it's pretty sophisticated. It can actually preserve local state so you have some text typed into a, a form or something. It'll preserve that and just reload the part that changed. It's cool stuff. I found that, generally speaking, I never feel like I'm, I'm going to hit Command R anyways and refresh because I don't ever trust that it really reloaded correctly. And so uh, once you don't trust the hot reloading, then it, I find that it's, it's not very useful because you will refresh anyways. But there are folks who, who uh, find that a very useful part of the development workflow. You don't get that with the asset pipeline. Uh, there's just not really a practical way of doing that uh, with the way things are currently implemented. Document these last two are basically this, the same. Uh, documentation is lacking, and there's not a lot of the, the asset pipeline approach. Like I said, it's not exclusive to Grails, and yet for the most part, it's only Grails that uses it, um, at least as far as uh, on, in the larger community. And so there's not a lot of other folks doing tutorials and other folks, you know. Uh, contributing documentation and so forth outside of the Grails community. And so um, that can be, a, if you are if you have not chosen one of these approaches I'm going to be talking about today, um, this could be a downside because there's going to be, a, there's going to be relatively, a, um, there's, going to be, there's going to be less just community support available on, through online channels um, compared to some of the other, other tools we're going to talk about. So that brings us to what I call the hybrid. And um, I call it that because it still uses the asset pipeline, um, but it also uses some uh, arrangement of JavaScript build tooling as well. And this is not an approach that I invented exactly. I did come across it by myself, but others have come across it as well. It's nothing uh, groundbreaking. The, the general idea here is you're going to want to, you're gonna merge a, what would normally be a standalone front end project like in Angular or in React, and you're going to somehow bridge that 
with a Grails project. And you're going to leave the processing of the JavaScript project to native JavaScript tooling, um, something like Webpack, which is what we're going to be talking about. One of the ways this can be made to work, because Grails 3 um, uses Gradle as its build system, uh, there's already Gradle and Node uh, integration through a, a Gradle plugin, which lets us tie essentially Node or JavaScript build tasks into our Gradle build. Right? That means that when we run our app or we build a WAR file or a JAR file, an executable JAR file, we also process and package our front end assets. So the, the Gradle Node plugin uh, makes all that come together. Otherwise, you'd have to have a separate build step. You have to run a separate command or separate script to process those things. Um, the idea here is that we'll be serving the JavaScript app via the Grails view layer. So we'll still be using GSPs, potentially. Um, we'll be using the asset pipeline. Um, this is a good approach to take if you are not necessarily ready to ditch your entire existing front end, which might already be based on GSPs, and you want to start bringing in React or Angular. Um, th this is a, a, a worthwhile approach to consider, because it is, it's not all or nothing. You could have parts of your application that are single page app and parts that are still GSP pages. They can be backed by the same controllers. Am I doing something? Might be bumping the headset a little too much. Um, so it's a very forgiving approach. It's not all or nothing. You, have, you still have access to the Grails internationalization. In fact, even if you are building a single page application, if you're building it from within the Grails app, um, there's ways that you can actually include the I18N internationalization messages into your JavaScript application. Um, I was going to say inject them, but it's not dependency injection. It's just a matter of telling your, build, your JavaScript build tool where to find the internationalization, internationalization messages and processing them, making them available to your, um, your single page application. So that's kind of cool because then you don't have to redo internationalization in two, two places. If you're interested in server-side rendering of JavaScript in Java, this is pretty much the only approach that's available. Um, and that's, that would be if, you, if you're interested in playing with the Nashorn uh, script engine in Java 8 on up. Uh, I've done a little bit of proof of concept with that. It does work. I'm not sure how practical it is, but some folks are really interested in server-side rendering. And for those, if you're not familiar with it, server-side rendering is the idea that rather than sending Java, sending, um, how should I put this? When you're building a JavaScript uh, application using a framework, there's typically a lot of non-plain JavaScript that has to be processed and parsed, and, and then you have you know, some data binding that's going on. And normally that's all done in the browser, which means that when the user accesses the application, they get an empty HTML page and a bunch of JavaScript. And the, there's no content on the page until that JavaScript has been run and done its thing. And then you see, you know, on, on a slow client, you might see a flash of a white screen before all that JavaScript kicks in. Uh, with server-side rendering, that initial render of the JavaScript happens on the back end. And instead of receiving a blank page, the client receives a fully formed HTML page with all of the data that would normally have been gotten through an API call already embedded in the page. And so you get an instant render of an actual functioning page. And then, assuming that your, that your JavaScript framework supports this, the event handling will be hooked in after the fact. And that, after that point, the normal rendering process works, uh, kicks in. Um, again, this is, a, the, this is an, a, I, would, I would call an edge case um, at best. I've not found anyone who was really seriously considering doing this in production in Java, in the Java world. Um, in the Node.js world, this is very common. Uh, isom uh, isomorphic um, applications, uh, where basically the same application is executed on the server and then the output is delivered to the client. That can be done with this approach. Um, if anyone's seen the J hipster stack, it's a um, Spring Boot Angular uh, integration. Um, I've taken a look at it, and it's, it's quite similar to the approach I'm outlining here. Um, that slide doesn't belong here. Oh, this explains something. So my slides are out of order. I apologize. I'll have to fix that. This was the slide I wanted to be talking about initially. So uh, the hybrid um, web app uh, approach that I've 
outlined here is really, it really hinges upon the Webpack build tool. Um, there's others on that slide we were looking at earlier with all the crazy logos coming down. Um, there are other options, but Webpack has become the dominant one, I would say, at least for now, in, um, in building JavaScript applications. Um, you can kind of think of it as analogous to Gradle in a way, and also analogous to the asset pipeline itself. Um, it's a, they, they call it a module bundler. Um, what that means is that uh, what Webpack does is it traverses all of your front-end source code. It builds a dependency graph. It figures out what files need other files, and it does this with a module system, which is why they call it a module bundler. It links those dependencies up. It can do optimizations. It can get rid of code that's not being used anywhere. It can, it can do um, chunking, where it delivers the code in uh, portions so it doesn't overwhelm the client, overwhelm the network. It's a very configurable tool, um, arguably too configurable, and we'll see what that looks like in a minute. Um, and the general idea with Webpack is it's going to go through all of your dependencies, it's going to do this mapping like I spoke of, build this dependency graph, and it's going to output a, usually a single bundle of JavaScript and maybe a bundle of CSS or, or any binary assets like images that you have there. Um, so it's going to turn all that, all those individual pieces, all those individual components you might be using into a single file that your browser is going to, going to, is going to accept. And that's typically more efficient than downloading, you know, making multiple network requests and downloading 25 files or 250 files. Um, it makes more sense to combine that into a single file. So that's what Webpack does. It takes assets like the ones here on the left. It runs them through a set of processors, which are called loaders in Webpack speak and then it outputs these, uh, these bundles that are typically, um, typically you have one JavaScript bundle and then you might have some other binary stuff included. Like I said, it's very configurable. Um, this is the Webpack config.js. This is taken right from their documentation and it's got everything you'll need and maybe a little bit more. Now, the good thing, there's a lot. Oh, there's more. Uh, that's not the whole page. Um, the, the bare minimum that you usually need, and this is actually, this is too small, this probably won't work the way I have it set up here, but it gets out the, the main sections that I wanted to point out. Um, the way Webpack config works is you define an entry point. This is going to be the first piece of JavaScript that Webpack will use to build out that dependency tree to figure out what other, so it's going to go to this file here, um, it's called uh, entry, and it's going to find out what files it needs. And then it's going to go to those files and find out which ones does it need, and it's going to build out a, a graph that way. Once you have an entry defined, you have to tell Webpack what to do with the output. And this is where it gets interesting as far as Grails goes, because this lets us tell Webpack where we want, where we want the uh, processed JavaScript application to end up. Um, and typically, you're going to put it uh, in, a, in a standalone, um, uh, like a, a node-based application that's going to just be your static asset directory. And we, we can take advantage of that in Grails. And then to configure the actual processing of your, of your code, so if you're taking your plain JavaScript, your, if you're taking your, your React app, for example, and you want to convert that into plain JavaScript so that your browser can, can actually do something with it, you do that by setting up a, um, a series of, of rules. And a rule is simply a type of a, a test to tell what kind of uh, file it's looking for. So here we're looking for uh, files that end with JSX. And then we're telling it, um, giving, a little more, a little, giving the, the, the processor a little more information about how to look up those files, which files to exclude. In this case, we're using a loader called Babel. And we're telling it to use a React preset. So this is going to find all the JSX files. It's going to process them using the React settings. And it's going to output them to that uh, place we have outlined uh, in the yellow above. So how can we take advantage of this in Grails? So because we can tell Webpack where to output um, the, these files, it's not just being served automatically, um, we can actually take advantage of that and simply plug in the processed um, JavaScript back into the asset pipeline. And at that point, we can deliver it to a GSP page or any, or, and basically treat it just like any other piece of JavaScript that you might use in a Grails application. Um, so, for example, in this approach, um, this is actually something that, that I, I've done for production applications, and it actually works pretty well. Um, usually, you're, you're going to want to put your JavaScript app, 
This is a React app, according to the logo. Um, you can put it in some directory where it's not going to be served by Grails. Um, uh, so I have source main web app there, and the advantage of source main web app is if you're building a jar file anyways, it's not going to include that, but you can put it, that's kind of arbitrary, you just put it, you don't, you don't put it in your assets directory, right? You don't want, you're not, you're not trying to, exp to, to expose these things um, to, to, to the browser, because the goal here is for Webpack to take these files, do its magic, and then the output from Webpack's um, processing is what we're going to send to the asset pipeline, right? The Grails app assets directory. Once it's there, you can load it on, on any GSP page, and you can execute or you can you know, run your JavaScript application uh, from, that, uh, from that point. There is a uh, profile that does exactly this approach, so if you want to see what it actually looks like, uh, you can take a look at the React Webpack profile. You can specify it when you're creating the application with create, create app, just pass the profile flag. So this is going to give you a React app. It's going to basically, uh, it, what it, it does, it implements the, the default Grails homepage that you already would see from a, a standard, a stock Grails application, but it's done in React. Um, so that application is going to be located in the source main web app directory. And when you run the application, uh, Gra the Gradle is going to run the Webpack build and send those files to uh, the asset pipeline. And you can just, you know, it's, it's worth taking a look at the profiles to see what the default project does. Um, and you'll, you'll see how the, how the wiring all, um, comes together. There's also a generic Webpack profile for Grails, which does essentially the exact same thing. It's just that it doesn't include React. It, it doesn't really do anything. It just includes the Webpack build tool. And I think there's a single line of JavaScript just to prove it works. Um, but you can take advantage of this if you have another JavaScript framework or something else that you would like to experiment with and play with. You can just um, use the Webpack profile, take the Webpack config, which I believe this is, um, I think this is the default Webpack config that's included. It's pretty simple. It just uh, handles things like CSS and uh, images. It doesn't, do any, it doesn't do any JavaScript framework specific processing. And you can take it and run with it from there. So some downsides to this approach. <clears throat> it can be a little complicated to set up. Now, the fact that it's in a profile helps because all the talking I've been doing the past five, 10 minutes, you don't really have to worry about. If you can use a profile, it gives you what you need. So this is a good um, candidate for a profile. If you wanted to create a hybrid web app using Angular, for example, uh, which there is not a profile for that currently, um, you could create a profile to do that for you, and then um, setting up the project would be much simpler from then on. Uh, the project structure can be a little bit confusing. Um, I find it's not that bad as long as all the, because once you set up some arbitrary location for the front end application, uh, source code to live, whatever's, whatever file structure is in there is, is arbitrary. And you can use whatever will be conventional with your chosen um, uh, JavaScript uh, framework and JavaScript tooling. There's not really documentation on this approach because it's just, um, it's kind of, you know, putting things together um, uh, manually. You do have to be concerned about routing. Um, so if you're familiar with um, frameworks like Angular or React, um, you can set up a routing library so that you can have essentially pages within your single page application. And those pages don't, re they don't request a new page from the browser, they load a new component. And they do it all in place. But it gives you the ability to use the, the forward and back button. It lets your browser history populate, it lets you bookmark pages within a single page application. Um, that all can work fine. You just need to be aware, depending on the, on the routing tool you're using, um, if, if your routes, if, if the Grail server thinks that your route is a path to a controller, um, it's going to 404 on you and never actually uh, render the route like you expect. Um, the solution to that is to use um, hash-based routing, as a, uh, which is where you have a um, a hash symbol followed by the route. Um, this is not a Grail specific problem. It's it's anytime you're using a backend that doesn't know how to, that, that is not configured to send all requests to, um, to let let all route route requests rather um, be handled in the, on the front end. Um, you'll have the same problem. It, it takes special configuration even on, on a Node app to make that work. And a downside is that you do have to um, learn Webpack, which it, it's not. I mean, I've done it. It's not that bad, but it, it's 
not the most user-friendly tool in my, my experience. The last approach that I wanted to look at, how are we doing for time? When is this session supposed to wrap up? 20 minutes past is when we're done? Okay, well, we're, we're just about done. So I will try to, yeah, we start kind of late too, so I will do my best to wrap this up in the next two minutes. So the last approach, and this one hopefully will be the simplest to explain, and this is what I call the multi-project build. Um, at this point, basically we're saying is we're not going to try to do anything fancy and merge the JavaScript app with the Grails app. We're going to let them be separate entities, let them have their own conventions, their own project structure. Um, we're just going to treat them as separate applications. And then optionally, we can take, take advantage of Gradle's multi-project build, and we can do some stuff. For instance, we can use the Gradle node integration to um, tie in processing of our front-end application with the Grails application. Right? We can do things like um, build and test the, the JavaScript app through Gradle tasks instead of through NPM uh, commands. And that makes it easier if you're, for instance, using a Jenkins, um, CL, uh, a Jenkins uh, um, continuous integrations um, tool. Um, you could set that up using Gradle tasks that are building and testing your Angular app, for example, without having to um, worry about um, Node.js um, stuff. So the multi-project build, like I said, you just have a separate application for the front end and the Grails application. Um, you have to worry about cross-origin re uh, requests, and that's super simple because Grails supports, uh, has native support for cores now. Um, there's not much, there's really no coupling between the, the front end and back end projects, so you can point the front end project at, at any, any server. Um, and you can have separate development teams or develop, development workflows for both the front and the back for the front and the back end. And as far as the front end goes, you are totally in JavaScript land, which is that if that's what you want to be, this is great. Um, so we have a lot of profile support for this approach, and that's because um, it doesn't really matter what's in the front end, right? And it, it could be any front end project that's able to be run standalone and you can make uh, rest calls and so forth. So we have um, currently profiles for Angular, um, using this approach, it creates an a server and a client project with uh, Grails and with Angular. Um, we have one for React. Follows the exact same conventions. All three of these profiles are essentially the same profile. The only thing that changes is that front-end project has, is, is using a different framework. And the frameworks themselves, uh, the, the front-end projects themselves, are just using the official CLI. So that's Angular CLI for Angular, Create React App, which is a CLI for React, and then the latest one is Vue, uh, which uses Vue CLI for the front-end project. Um, all these approaches are essentially the exact same project structure. Uh, some downsides, it, it can complicate your deployment workflow. Um, you, can, you, you can do some stuff with Gradle to, to make that smoother, um, but it's something to be aware of. You are completely cut off from any Grails Vue uh, layer at that point, so you don't get GSPs, you don't get, I mean, you could have GSPs separately, but you have no, um, um, there's nothing helping you to, to use the two together, and you're losing um, access to the Grails internationalization. And you will need to learn how to operate a uh, JavaScript build uh, flow. I'm not going to go into detail on this. Um, there's a, a Grails guide you can look at. This is the idea here is you can actually package the Grails application and the JavaScript application into a single uh, executable jar file, um, which can be kind of cool. In fact, we have, I think we have at this point, a sample application running on, um, at our table that's doing exactly this, where it's a React app, a Grails app, it's packaged in an executable jar, you just run the jar and you get the, both the, the front end and the back end running together. And there's a, a Grails guide on how to set that up for Angular and for React. So those are the three approaches that I've found. Um, I've used all three of these in production. They all work. They have their pros and cons. Um, a lot of it's going to depend on the makeup of your team and how comfortable you are with doing things the Grails way, uh, with the asset pipeline, for example, versus how much um, JavaScript build experience your team has already, and you might want to use either the hybrid approach or just standalone and um, just take advantage of Grails uh, REST capabilities um, for uh, backing up your single page application and maybe using Gradle to bring those two things together. I already mentioned routing conflicts, something to be aware of, the non-standard project structure um, is uh, another, another um, 
potential pitfall. People, you know, there are conventions for how to set up your code, even in the front end world, and it can be it can be uh, difficult for people to figure out um, figure out what you're doing when you start bringing stuff together. So, wrapping up. So, in my opinion, Grail still has a bright future as far as modern web app development goes. I found it be a, it, it works really well as a back end, uh, even for single page applications. Um, the, the plugin system, profiles, uh, the integration with Gradle means that Grails can adapt to a lot of situations, a, a lot of types of application. Maybe not everything, but a lot. Um, and the, the server-side the server side features that Grails has are just as good as they were before, and they still work really well. And that's basically my argument, is this Grails worked well for making Grails applications um, before JavaScript frameworks became uh, the thing, and I think that it still works uh, quite well as a, as a, a back-end framework, um, again, because of the emphasis on developer productivity. I'm not going to go ahead and read through all the links. You can look up the slides yourself. This is just resources that I found useful, links to the different profiles that we have. If you ever have questions about any of the profiles, um, please see me. I wrote most of them, um, and so I, 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 feedback is very much appreciated on that. That's it. Sorry I went a little bit over, um, but thank you for coming. Should I take a question, or are we about done? Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. There actually is, um, and so it's not the, the the problem is that there's no linking. So you, the question is about environments. So you, if you have, for instance, I'm not sure what's going on there. If you have, for instance, um, different backend servers that you want to be hitting in development versus test versus production, um, you know how to set that up. Uh, and in at least I know for sure in the React um, pro the React prof uh, profile, and I'm pretty sure Angular supports this as well because uh, Node Node itself has this concept of environments. Uh, the problem is there's nothing really telling the front end app and the back end app together what environment they're in. Um, so you, in development, they're both going to be in development by default. When you build a production version, when you build a, a, the, the production version of the front end app, it's going to use the production uh, environment. And so at that point, you can have a, um, a if you have a, a production, I'm not sure what's doing this, if you have a production um, setting for that server URL. They'll use that instead of the one set in development. Um, as far as like uh, switching them on demand, you would have to do that using you know, whatever, the, um, uh, whatever the proper way of doing that is for a, just a general node-based application. But you can uh, run the client in different environments um, to hit different, different servers. I don't know if it's my head that's doing this or if it's... Anyways, does that answer your question? Okay. All right, well thanks again.